a summary of how this is going to work. So we'll get started with Patrick. So Patrick is BPSA's Student Exchange Officer. So he'll be able to talk to you a bit about the BPSA Student Exchange Programme. We'll then move on to Alice. So Alice works for the World Health Organization, as you can see with her wonderful background. Um, and then we'll have Louisa. Louisa works with the International Pharmaceutical Federation, the Young Pharmacist Group. And then we've got Victoria, who works for the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association. And then a big Q&A at the end, so we can answer all your questions. So, without further ado, I think we'll get started and have Patrick begin and just explain to everyone a little bit about the Student Exchange Programme. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you, Daniel, for the introduction there. Um, I'll just share my slides. Um, So um, okay, let me just do it there. I don't know whether you can see that or not. Um, uh, it's just loading, I think. Yeah, still loading for me. Oh, perfect. Yeah, all good. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. So, um, hello everyone. My name is Patrick Hare and I'm the Student Exchange Officer for the BPSA. And I'm a second year student at uh, Kingston University, London. And this evening, I'm just going to give a brief introduction into the Student Exchange Programme, um, how it works, uh, what you can gain from it, and also um, how you can apply and get involved. So the Student Exchange Programme, SEB, is, is short, short for SEB, and it has been running since 1952. Um, it's a programme that provides pharmacy students and pre-reg pharmacists with the valuable opportunity to undertake a professional pharmacy placement uh, whilst learning about a country's host culture or about a country's culture. Um, SEB is actually IPSF's uh, largest project. So IPSF is an international uh, Pharmaceutical Students Federation and about every year about a thousand students from around the world are given the opportunity to experience pharmacy practice in more than 70 countries um, and this project has been running since 1952. Um, the BPSA along with the IPSF member organizations organize the exchanges by finding host sites where students are trained. Um, the program runs throughout the year um, but the majority of exchanges happen and take place from May to September. Um, for UK students going abroad, they can go on a summer student exchange programme, and this usually takes place from May to September. Um, during the exchange, uh, participants can share and develop uh, pharmaceutical knowledge and skills. At the same time, this is a very unique um, opportunity to experience new cultures, try different food, meet new friends, from all around the world and by learning a new language, visiting new places and enjoy um, trips and excursions with other pharmacy students. Um, it's important to remember, I suppose, that um, being a BPSA member, it gives you, um, you're automatically a member of IPSF. Um, so therefore you can, um, you're eligible to take part in SEB. So how is SEB run? Um, SEB is coordinated by the BPSA in association with the IPSF. Um, it consists of many different teams. Firstly, we have the chairperson of the student exchange, um, and then we have the student exchange committee, which consists of a group of people which assists the chairperson in organizing the smooth running of SEB worldwide. And then we have uh, student exchange officers who are based in every country, and um, they help with the running of SEB in each country. And then we have local exchange officers who are part of the SEB team within the country and they help and assist the SEO and they also um, make direct contact with the host and incoming students um, directly. But everyone involved in running SEB ensures exchange students have a fantastic SEB experience. Um, so where are I going SEB? Currently there are over 80 uh, countries worldwide participating in SEB and over um, 1,800 international exchanges taking place every year. 
Um, on this slide, you can see the various countries that take part in CEP, from Africa to the Americas, Eastern Mediterranean, Europe, and Asia Pacific. Um, each country is guaranteed an exciting exchange, allowing each student to learn and work in a pharmacy placement of your own choice. Um, so how much does it cost? So it's about, it's 42 euro to take part in CEP, which is about 36 pound. Um, and all expenses of CEP experience is dependent on the participant. So it's up to um, the actual student themselves, how much they would like to spend on accommodation um, and where they would like to go. Um, and as well as that, if you are not successful on taking part in SEB, then you will be, if you're not placed on the database, then 18 euros or 16 pound will be returned to you and the remainder of the 24 euros or 21 pound will be paid to the IPSF. Um, if for some reason your exchange was canceled, after being placed on the database um, and you cancelled your exchange yourself, then you wouldn't be entitled to get the £16 back. Um, however, this is a very small price to pay for such a worthwhile experience. Um, so just on how to get involved and how to create an application, the first thing is to visit ipsf.org and create an account. Um, you just fill out your details uh, choosing the BPSA as your home association. Um, and then you click on register now. Um, and after doing that, you click on the link sent via the email to make a password and upload a photo. Um, and I approve your application to make an application on the IPSF website. And then from that link, you log into your account and you create an online application. Um, just to be careful, choosing the correct year and then after choosing the correct year, you just click on create application. The application is divided into three different sections, personal information, um, education and experience, and lastly application. So for the personal information, you will be required to fill in um, your title, name, contact information, date of birth, passport number, emergency contact, contact information, and if you have any health conditions or allergies or food restrictions. Um, the education and experience, um, you just stage your ed education, languages you speak, work experience, um, any extracurricular activities, volunteering work and memberships with your BPSA or any other uh, various memberships. Um, if you just focus on your experience and skills that you can relate to SEB and how that might assist you and help you on your SEB experience and how that might benefit the host pharmacist that would really um, boost your application. Um, just with the last part then, um, here is where you stage the preferred um, countries that you'd like to visit, uh, choosing your top three, um, putting the first one in order of interest, um, and also your preferred field of work. Um, I suppose it's important to write your motivation in the um, SEB section as well, or in this section, just an interest in SEB, so just like a motivation letter um, explaining the reasons why you're so interested in taking part in the student exchange program. Um, also, another top tip for applications, um, talk about your interest in SEB. When choosing a field of work and um, a period of exchange, try and be as flexible as possible. Um, a lot of pharmacies and a lot of um, countries, a lot of SEOs will take on students who are quite flexible and open to um, undergoing any any experience at all. Also, if you just um, write a maximum of 500 words in clear English and double check for any spelling and grammar errors before submitting the application, that would be best. Um, so then you submit your application and sign the waiver of liability. Um, after doing this, then um, you just have to keep on checking your status on the IPSF um, website, making sure that um, it's been approved. And if your um, application form is reserved, um, and then you just stay in contact with the host SEO and agree on the conditions of the exchange. So we'll say what hours you want to work, um, where you're going to be working, and what's involved in the actual set. And then if you just wait for your application form to be placed in the database, 
um, and after being placed, ask for an invitation letter if you need it uh, from your host uh, student exchange officer. So the invitation, oh, I'll just go back. The invitation letter is just a letter outlining proof that you're coming to that country for a student exchange program and it might help with uh, visa requirements. And then lastly, it's just to enjoy your exchange with um, IPSF's SEB program. So here's just a quick summary of the procedure of going through the application. Um, and it's just a quick summary. Um, just important to note for UK students that applications have now opened for the student exchange program and they will remain open until 31st of December. And if you could just get your applications in as soon as possible. Um, also, we have set up an uh, Instagram account there a few weeks ago. So if you could just give us a follow on Instagram, that would be great. Just to keep up to date with any um, deadlines or any application deadlines that we might have. Um, if you have any questions at all, feel free to email me on um, seo at bbsa.co.uk. Um, also, if you have any questions, you can just drop them in the chat and I'll be more than happy to answer them right now. Or if you want to wait, you can just leave them in the chat or you can just send me an email. Um, thank you for listening to me. And I hope that session was, or the talk was really informative. Um, I'll hand you over to Daniel now. Thank you so much, Patrick. That was really, really good. And it's a position that I was in last year as well. So it's very dear to my heart. Um, I can see the participants' numbers going up as well, which is really great to see. Um, I think we'll probably come to questions at the end. Um, so if you need to bolt them, that's absolutely fine. I can try and answer them, but if you want to stay on, that's also okay. But thank you so much for that. Really, really good job. Okay, so we'll now move on to Alice. So Alice um, is working on the development and implementation of the WHO Academy First Learning Programs. And the WHO Academy is the World Health Organization's state-of-the-art lifelong learning center, bringing the very latest innovations in adult learning to global health. Um, she's also a pharmacist by background graduated um, from the University and Management School in Lyon. Uh, previously, she's worked in the pharmaceutical industry in the USA and France on scientific communications initiatives related to non-communicable and infectious diseases. So I'll now pass you over to Alice and see if you can get your screen shared. Um, yes, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, let me share up. Can you, can you see my presentation now? I can, yeah, perfect. perfect. Thank you so much. Perfect, well, thank you very much um, for the invitation. Um, it's, a very, it's a very nice honor to be presenting today and I hope I'll be able to share certain information that can be useful for the students. Um, from my understanding, most of you are British students. So as you can hear, I'm French. I did all my studies in France. But I also had the opportunity to do several, um, I would say, international exchange during my studies. And so I highly, highly recommend to do so because, I mean, this is a unique opportunity during your studies and you will learn so much by going abroad, even if it's for a few weeks. Uh, it's really nice. So um, what? So as Daniel was saying, I'm working as a learning officer in the WHO Academy. Um, so don't hesitate to reach out to me on LinkedIn. It's uh, Alice Malachan on LinkedIn. If you have any questions or if you want any advice, I would be happy uh, to to respond. Um, so um, I think I have a 15 minutes uh, slot. So what I'm proposing to present is very briefly to talk about uh, what I've been doing so far, what type of, um, of jobs I've been doing before joining the WHO. Uh, then I'm gonna do a very brief presentation on the World Health Organization. I know you already know well this organization, but it's always good to have a reminder of what is the goal of WHO. And then I will more specifically present the WHO Academy, which is the department I'm working on. Um, we'll have a very short virtual roundtable on what is learning, what does learning means to you as pharmacists or as pharmacy students. And there I'm going to share some job opportunities if you want to work for the UN or for WHO 
I'm going to share a few links with you and talk about different programs that the organization has put in place. So first, I've um, so what I've done is I've uploaded my CV on the World Cloud Generator to see what it looks like. And so as you can see, the most common word that would, uh, you can find on my CV is working on different projects, working on communication at the international level, and always also working on the medical and sometimes the marketing aspects. So as Daniel was saying, I have done my pharmacy studies in France in Lyon, and then I've combined pharmacy with a management school also in Lyon. And uh, after this, I've decided to do work in the private sector. So first in a consulting company in Paris, and then I went to New York in the US to work in the Sanofi group. And this was mainly to work on scientific communication on diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Um, to have my first real, I would say, working opportunity in the US was really, really good for me because I think it's a different culture than in France where as a young professional, you're giving a lot of responsibilities and there's a, a, a culture which is more about risk-taking than in France. So I've learned so much during this first uh, job opportunity in the US. And then after this, I came back to my city in Lyon in France, where I've worked in Sanofi Pasteur, uh, working on the medical part for the launch of a new meningococcal vaccine. Um, so that was basically three years of my working experience. And then I've decided that I wanted to work um, in the public sector. So to work in, I would say, in a more diverse type of workplace with more international and inclusive projects. So that's why I started to look at opportunities in international organization, in foundation. And when I've heard about the W2 Academy project, which I'm going to explain later, uh, which is uh, happening in my city in Lyon. I've done anything I could to join the WHO and to join the WHO Academy. And I've been now working within WHO for a year. So just to say that uh, when I was a student, when I was a pharmacy student, I really didn't know what I was doing, what I want to do in my life. I didn't really have a career plan at all. But if, if you take the, the opportunities that are open to you, if you try to always think about different sector, you should try to connect with people working in different sector. This is really a good way to find a place where you think it's, it's best fit for you. And that's, I think for me, that's where I found WHO, which actually really fulfilled me at the personal and professional level. So um, very briefly, uh, as you know, the World Health Organization is the UN Agency for Health. And the purpose of the WHO is really to help um, people achieve the highest possible level of health. Um, and the WHO is organized in three main entities. The first one is what we call the World Health Assembly. And this is really the decision making for WHO. Um, it's attended by all member states and other actors like internal governmental, non-governmental organization. And it's actually meeting this week in, uh, in Geneva and online to discuss the role of WHO during a pandemic. So this is really the main entity of WHO. Then you have what we call the executive board, which is uh, which has two main roles. The first one is really an executive role on to how to ensure all the decisions made by the health assemblies can actually be carried out. And then the executive board also has an advisory board. So to advise the health assembly, but also um, the director general of WHO. And then finally, you have the secret secretariat, which is basically all WHO staff, all, the, all WHO staff working um, under the direction of Dr. Tedros, the director general of the WHO. So the role of WHO, I would say, is mainly twofold. The first one is the one that we know most, at least in Europe, is the normative work. So WHO is responsible to set norms, to set standards at the international level. It's also driving all the global strategy, the policies, the guidelines for public health and establishing treaties like the international health regulation. And it's also helping countries to produce WHO resolution that will be voted at the health assembly. So that's the first type of work. The second type of work that the World Health Organization is doing it's really about regional and country work. So as you can see here, the WHO is organized in six different regions with headquarters in different countries and which really covers the 194 member states within the organization. 
And the regional and country work of WHO is to support countries in implementing all the programs, all the plans, the resolution and the treaties. It's also to help countries to translate those norms and standards into their local context. And then finally, to monitor the progress at the country level. So um, that's, that's for WHO, a very brief overview. And then I would like to present the department I'm working in within WHO, which is called the WHO Academy. And as Daniel presented earlier, it's really focusing on lifelong learning for health workers and public uh, policy makers and public health managers around the world. And what the Academy is trying to achieve and is, is targeting is many challenges that we're seeing today. So as we see today, um, there is the United Nations has set sustainable development goals that they want to achieve. And today we can see that no countries are on track to meet those SDGs. The second challenge we're seeing is that it often takes more than 10 years to implement all the guidance, all the normative work of WHO into actual practice. The third challenge that you, you already know as pharmacy and pharmacy students is that the science, the medical science, is doubling every three months, even more during the COVID pandemic. And it's very hard for healthcare workers to stay up to date with all this new uh, science information. The fourth challenge is that with COVID-19, a lot of lifelong learning systems have been disrupted. And so there's a really high demand for digital learning for healthcare workers around the globe. So what we need now is health workers that are equipped with the right knowledge, with the right competencies to be able to perform their role. And so now what I'm going to show you is a very brief video presenting what is the WHO Academy and how it can actually um, meet those challenges. And I can't hear any volume. Ah. Sorry. You can't hear the sound? No sound at the moment. Ah. Um, don't know. Because me, I can hear. Um... Okay, uh, otherwise, uh, I guess, um, because it's in French. Okay. So, <laughs> so if you can read the subtitles, I guess, because, um, because me, I can hear the sound, so. I guess you could talk through it if it's not too long, but. Yeah, now? I can't hear any sound. Give it a try. Ah, oh, wait. And now? Have you pressed play? Um, for me, it's just on like the screen that you paused on. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, sorry. It's okay. I'm gonna be sure. Wait. No worries. Um. Up. And just, I'm gonna, uh, speakers and speakers. And let me know now if you can hear. Okay. Can you hear? No, no, no sound. But if you want to just sort of describe what's happening, maybe that would be the best option. But we can see the subtitles. Yeah, because I mean, it's in French, so. So if you can read the subtitles, it would be great. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Sorry, you couldn't uh, hear the sound, um, but I hope you understand that the objective of the WHO Academy 
is to transform the way the WHO was doing, I would say, simple trainings for health workers and to really have a lifelong learning solution that is focusing on the impacts. And so the academy is working on learning solution that can that will be available digitally through computers, through mobile, that will be available also in low bandwidth settings. Um, and the idea is to have, I mean, digital solution that learners can personalize uh, according to the career, according to the needs. And one of the main also, um, I would say, key success factor of the academy is that it will be offering digital credential that would recognize the competencies gained by the learners. And this, the fourth, fourth point is that the WHO Academy is really using the latest technology that are available today, which is mixed reality, uh, artificial intelligence, and also serious educational gaming. Um, and when we talk about transforming lifelong learning, we really talk about four different aspects. Um, the WHO wants to go from what we used to do, which was no, knowledge-based training to competency-based training. Um, it's also uh, to go from programs that are designed for priority needs to programs that are personalized for every learners. And the WHO Academy will not be giving certificate of completion, certificate of attendance to a specific training, but it will be giving credential that assess the decision-making competencies of healthcare workers and policymakers around the globe. And finally, um, the success of the program within the WHO Academy will not be measured in terms of numbers of people trained, but in terms of impact and the behavior change seen uh, after a training, a learning program is completed. Um, so um, this is a, a bit of background about the WHO and the WHO Academy, but I also want to hear from you um, around the, I mean, around the table, the virtual table. And so I've prepared two big questions for you. And it's really for you to think of what is training, what is learning for you as pharmacy student or pharmacist, if there are any on the on the call today. And so what I'm proposing is there's two questions. I'm going to leave one minute per question. And you have two options. Either you can annotate directly on the slide using the annotate option on Zoom, uh, which is available on the upper corner of the, of the screen if you click on view option and then annotate. So you can either draw or type directly on the slides, or if it doesn't work, just free, uh, feel free to put any comments directly on the chat. So I will, I will show you my first question I have prepared for you. Um, and I will leave you a little bit less than a minute um, to annotate or to uh, talk in the chat. So the question is, what do you feel is missing? Or what would you love to add to your professional development journey as pharmacist, as future pharmacist, or as pharmacist? So it's really, it's not necessarily about classroom trainings or, or anything that we, we regularly have during, a, I would say, a university curriculum, but it's more, what can you think about innovative way to learn that you don't have today? And what will help you to better, um, better train as a pharmacist? So feel free to annotate on the slide if you can, or, or draw or put any words on the slide or on the chat if uh, it's easier for you. I hope the, the annotates. Uh, I, I can't see if anyone is. Oh, yeah. Perfect. So more placements to practice, more exposure to the industrial pharmacy throughout university, more hands-on clinical experience, helping those with health inequalities. So it's a lot about compu computational skills, more practice, yeah. So I see some which is specific topics and some is more about practice, about experience, about getting to know different sectors within the pharmacy, having a more, yeah, having a more international perspective of what is available, 
more IP. I'm not sure what is IP, sorry. How pharmacy practice differs across the world. That's an interesting topic also. Oh, th thank you, internal professional experiences. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, so a lot, so from what I understand, it's a lot about maybe networking opportunities around the world to discover different countries, different practice in different countries, to, differ, to discover different sectors. And then there's other needs which are more, I would say, skills-based uh, and more specific to, um, to a specific topic. Okay, that's, that's great. Don't hesitate to, to keep putting on the chat. Um, now I have a second question for you. Uh, let me just, uh, sorry. I'm just gonna erase, sorry, how do we, let's see. Okay, perfect. So now my second question for you is, I would say uh, a question where you have to think big and dream about what would be, what should learning look like in 10 years? So let's say um, you're, a pharmacist, you're a pharmacy student in 2031, or you are young professional in 2031, what would learning look like? And you can dream. Feel free to annotate or comment. We can't annotate as yours. Ah. Ah, uh, Danielle, I think it's okay. Just just write on the chat then. Don't worry. Uh, because I don't want to take too much time. Yeah, I think we'll just stick with the chat. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. It works okay. Perfect. So, what would learning look like in twenty thirty one? Do you have in, in, any ideas? Artificial intelligence in pharmacy. Pharmacists are more clinically important. Yeah. Learning and practicing pharmacy scenarios using virtual reality. Yeah, but that, yeah, that's a really good one. And this is tools that the academy is actually piloting, 3D printing, perhaps more use of AI across learning, simulated patient, yeah. Practice better learning through work placement. Yeah, practice learning. Detail. Hybrid classes, true interprofessional learning, VR classes, clinical based learning in university, yeah. So, so a lot about, again, being immersed, like, like being immersed in scenarios in new sectors and trying to experience more than than traditional learning. That's great, perfect. Thank you everyone, thank you for all your inputs. I think this is really great comment and I think um, we have a lot to do and that's really what the Academy is trying to do is to bring all those immersive tools, new technology to be able for, for health workers to really experience the learning and not always, I mean, be drive by knowledge-based learning. So I'm just trying, okay. So now this is my, I just have two last slides, which is to talk about uh, the different programs that um, the WHO has put together to recruit young professional. Um, so uh, I have prepared a list of links that I'm gonna share with you and you can go directly on the website. But just so you know, there's four main programs that the WHO has. Uh, to recruit young professionals. So um, you have the JPO, the Junior Professional Officer Program, which is the program I'm part of. And uh, you can go on the website to find more information. This is a really, really great program that I highly recommend. You have the internship program, of course, uh, from WHO, which is currently on hold because of COVID, but it's gonna restart very soon. So if you're interested in doing an internship for WHO, please check the website as much as possible and it should restart very soon. And then you have also UN Volunteers Program, that is also a great opportunity, and the Young Professional Program, which has just launched now, uh, which is targeting least developed countries. So I, have from, I think most of you are from the UK, so you're not um, targeted by this program. And then if you want to specifically work, sorry, for the WHO Academy, uh, you have also uh, this website, WHO Academy Work With Us, where we are posting all job opportunities or internship opportunities, so you can also go there for any information. And last but uh, not least, 
please scan the QR code if you want to subscribe to our mailing list and if you want to learn more about what the WHO Academy is doing. Thank you everyone for hearing me. I hope uh, I gave you useful information and I'm available if you have any question. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for that. That was really, really informative and yeah, really good engagement there as well. So it's really great to think about the future of pharmacy and what sort of things that we can be looking towards developing in the future um, and also having those opportunities. It's really, really going to be beneficial. So definitely if you are considering maybe a role in international pharmacy, something like working with the UN or WHO is such a great starting point if you can get you know involved with their mailing list. Um, or try and research some of their opportunities will definitely help with your CV and professional development. So really, really great job there, Alice, and thank you so much for that. Um, um, I've just posted all the links on the chat. Perfect. perfect. So Thanks. links in the chat. And if anyone wants to be taking photos of slides um, as we go on, do feel free to do that. Um, and we will have our Q&A at the end to um, answer the questions. So do keep putting them in the um, Q&A section and we will come to them at the end or we may have some of them um, typed out, some of the answers. But thank you, Alice. We'll now move on to Louisa, if that's okay. So Louisa currently serves as the president-elect for FIPYPG, which is the International Pharmaceutical Federation Young Pharmacist Group, and works as a clinical pharmacist in the emergency department at the University of Washington Medical Center in Seattle in the USA. She's been involved in international pharmacy organizations, um, including IPSF and the ones I just mentioned, since she was in pharmacy school and first attended the 2016 IPSF World Congress in Harare, Zimbabwe. Uh, these organizations have given her opportunities to speak at multiple international congresses and travel to four different continents. Louise is passionate about encouraging students and early career pharmacists and pharmaceutical sciences scientists to develop their leadership skills and find innovative ways to impact and improve the profession. And I'll now pass over to you um, and see if have you got your slides ready. You do? Okay, if you want to try and um, get those up now. All right. Okay, yep, you can see it. Okay, there okay. we go. And you can hear me okay? Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about both FIP and YPG and some of the YPG priorities and the roles that are available within YPG. So FIP has been around for more than 100 years. It was founded in 1912, um, and it's a global federation representing pharmacists, pharmaceutical scientists, and pharmacy educators all over the world. Um, it's a non-governmental organization that's had official relationships with WHO since 1948. Um, and our vision is really to have a world where everyone benefits from access to safe, effective, quality, and affordable medicines and pharmaceutical care. Um, so we do that by supporting the advancement of practice, science, and education within pharmacy. So um, I'm going to talk a bit today about what this concept of one fifth is, but essentially we as an organization unite all of the different areas of pharmacy, so education, science, and practice. Um, here you can kind of see all of the different sections within FIP and um, all of the different groups that we represent, and you can see it really spans all of those um, different areas that I mentioned. Um, so essentially we're unique in the fact that we do represent all of these different elements of pharmacy. Um, and here you can kind of see the structure of FIP. So we've got the council and the bureau, you can see YPG represented and the Congress programming committee, and then the three bodies of BPS, which is the board of pharmaceutical sciences, BPP, which is the board of pharmaceutical practice, and then FIP education. So that um, academic aspect of the profession. So as I mentioned, um, YPG is one of the parts of FIP, and that's really where I'll focus since um, it's a great way to get involved 
um, as a young early career professional, whether you're still a student or just graduated. On this slide, you can see all of our subcommittee for this year, which I'll talk a bit in, de in detail. Um, but let's start with just asking the question, have you actually heard of YPG before? Um, so you can either scan the QR code or type in the code on the screen. And hopefully this works so we can see everyone's responses. Okay. And you should be able to see that code still on the screen. And um, I can see the like the graph now, but not the code. So I don't know oh. it's worth popping the code in the chat or or they can type the number in, I guess that would be fine. Yeah, that's I was thinking, yes, I meant the number, sorry. That's okay. I wonder if it's not refreshing properly. Maybe. I submitted my vote. Um, might just need to refresh. Maybe. Let's see. Oh, there Aha! We go. There <laughs> we go. Okay, so this is really great to know that um, maybe half of the audience hasn't heard of YPG before. So hopefully you'll learn a lot from this presentation. Um, and definitely, if you hadn't heard of it before, you'll know a lot by the time um, I'm done speaking, hopefully. Okay. So um, as of December of last year, which we're still compiling the data for this year, we had 100, I'm sorry, 1,341 individuals from 104 countries within YPG. Um, and that membership number had increased by 22.5% over that year, um, with 300 new members joining in the year of 2020. Our current steering committee for 2021 includes um, members from all over the world. So Ren Lee from Australia is our president. I'm in the USA. And then we have uh, our secretary, Maria, who is currently in France, but originally from Argentina our chairperson of projects in Nigeria, Ikwaibom, and then Lucas, who's from Brazil, but currently in the Ukraine. So definitely all over the world. Um, and we essentially um, head the subcommittee that does the work of YPG throughout the year. So um, here you can see the full subcommittee for 2021. Um, it's 40 plus members, so lots of leadership opportunities available within our organization for early career professionals. So in 2021, really our goal was to align with the one FIP strategy that I mentioned and the FIP development goals, which I'll discuss in a moment. Um, but essentially we try to build relationships with FIP leaders, which allows uh, early career professionals to have an impact within FIP and therefore a good impact within the profession. Uh, we also try to focus on capacity building for our members. So since we are all young professionals, there's definitely areas in which we can help with continuing education and um, learning leadership and all sorts of things like that. And then just kind of explaining what the value is to be a member of YPG and FIP. So um, the FIP development goals are 21 goals, similar in a way to the WHO SDGs, um, and focus on all aspects of the pharmaceutical profession and how pharmacists can impact uh, the world around us. So um, we really are trying to bring together science, practice, and workforce and education to transform the profession for the better and improve patient lives. You can read more about each of the individual goals here at FIP.org slash FIP development goals. Um, and then I also have a short video that only has some music in the background. So even if you can't hear it, hopefully um, it'll still be interesting.
So as I mentioned, it's really about advancing the whole pharmacy profession. So looking at it holistically, being able to bring together all of the different aspects of pharmacy, practice, science, workforce, and education to move the profession forward and improve patient lives. So um, just giving you that brief look at the DGs, I kind of wanted to see which of them might have stuck out to you as a student or early career professional to see um, which you think is the most important or most interesting. I'm gonna try refreshing again in hopes that we'll start to see, there we go. Okay, so definitely a focus on early career training. Uh, digital health made second place so far. Oh, leadership development is taking the lead on second place. Okay, great. So um, I think really, I would say that development goal two, early career training is definitely a huge focus for YPG, as well as obviously leadership development since so many of our activities are focused on that. Um, as young professionals, I think we're all interested in digital health and generally competency development is obviously useful to us um, to learn the things that we maybe didn't learn in school or may become new competencies in the future. So um, some of the ways that YPG uh, kind of takes the development goals and puts them into practice is through doing surveys of our members and essentially um, trying to learn more about um, our members' experiences. Are they satisfied with their current job? Uh, what skills do they wanna learn? Um, more about our national and regional needs within the body. So um, we did a number of surveys in 2020 and a couple surveys in 2021, which we will um, be publishing publishing um, for sharing that evidence that we've gathered. We also do all sorts of online campaigns and webinars, digital events that align with the development goals and um, provide additional information for our members. So World Immunization Week, information about managing drug abuse and addiction, and then obviously celebrating World Pharmacist Day. We additionally hold leadership development programs throughout the year and a workshop at the FIP Congress where um, attendees will build their portfolio and uh, read all sorts of interesting things about leadership and then have a larger discussion about how to build those leadership skills. Now introducing you to some of our current team members. As I mentioned, um, we have over 40 uh, subcommittee members, and part of that team is the liaisons to the different sections and uh, special interest groups within FIP. So here you can see um, the liaisons to academic pharmacy section, community pharmacy section, hospital pharmacy section, health and medicines information section, uh, social and administrative pharmacy section. So um, they essentially, um, go to meetings and represent YPG uh, with these FIP leaders. And then here are our liaison team to the special interest groups, which are more science-based. So drug and delivery manufacturing, new generation of pharmaceutical sciences, new medicines, and then pharmacy practice research are all some of the um, special interest groups, groups that we will liaise with. And then we have liaisons to um, other parts of FIP, so FIP education, the Workforce Development Hub. We also have a liaison to the uh, Youth Hub and then a liaison to the FIP Congress. Additionally, we have YPG representatives within various working groups within FIP. So this is a great opportunity for our members to get involved and actually help set some of the policies that FIP is making. Um, we have a representative within the global uh, expert advisory group on COVID-19, and then um, a, a representative on the FIP Data and Intelligence Commission as well. 
So liaisons essentially link communication between uh, the body that they are liaising to, so the section or special interest group, and then our YPG members. So they represent our interest at the meetings and then explore ways for YPG to be, be more involved in these sections or SIGs. So essentially um, finding ways of collaborating, doing reports together, doing webinars together, all sorts of interesting events um, and projects come out of these meetings. And then moving on to our projects team, uh, we have uh, various grants and coordinators for those grants. We have a mentorship program. We have a professional development team. Uh, this year, they've really been focused on our career development toolkit, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, but our mentorship program is one of our projects that runs for nine months, um, and we match mentors and mentees, um, and they will, you know, uh, meet regularly and the mentors will provide guidance to mentees on um, all sorts of aspects of career development, leadership, um, and, and all sorts of great advice. Um, our professional development team uh, this year is really focused on our career development toolkit, which um, we did a needs assessment survey in 2019 and then launched this toolkit in 2020. And then we've done a lot of digital events this year to promote the toolkit. Um, we also have a remote volunteering program with FIP. So uh, FIP will send an uh, email to YPG and ask us for a volunteer for a specific amount of time, uh, asking for certain skills and then telling us a little bit about the project. And then we send an email out to our members essentially asking for a volunteer. And um, right now, most of those volunteers are, are uh, remote. So it's a great opportunity to get more involved with YPG and FIP. Um, we also offer various grants and scholarships uh, that will help with travel expenses to attend the FIP Congress um, and even uh, do some research, which is pretty cool. Here's our current mentorship program, uh, mentees and mentors. So our mentees are YPG members and then the mentors, some of them are also YPG members and a lot of them are FIP leaders. And here's that career development toolkit I mentioned. It's available on the FIP YPG website. And if you're still kind of considering your career options, it does list over 100 jobs available within pharmacy. Um, so things that I'd never even thought of and things even as specific as my job, which is working in the emergency department um, are listed. So kind of gives you some great ideas if you're still kind of unsure what you wanna do. Moving on to our public relations team. Uh, first, we have the publications team. So they're really in charge of our newsletters that come out bi-monthly that share all the information about YPG activities, calls for getting involved, and then any other relevant information like um, information about new vaccines or new medicines that are coming out. And then we have our social media team or media team that are in charge of um, graphic design and all of our posts on social media. Um, and we really have, have had a great following both last year and this year. We do productivity Mondays on Mondays and midweek health tips on Wednesdays. So um, this is something that our followers really look forward to and uh, pretty exciting stuff. Then also within public relations, we have a member relations team that work with all of our uh, different national and regional YPGs. So um, in the different regions, we liaise with the Africa Young Pharmacist Group and then various national young pharmacist groups. Um, in the European region, we have Portugal and Turkey. In Asia and the Western Pacific, we have the Asian Young Pharmacist Group and then Indonesia, Taiwan, and Australia. So really um, trying to build our network all over the world um, by connecting with these young pharmacist groups in various regions and countries. Um, we also established a guideline for um, developing your own YPG in your own country. So um, that came out this year and has really um, also allowed us to kind of find new ways of connecting with our members. So now that I've told you a little bit about some of the roles that we have within YPG, I wanted to see what you would pick if you were to apply.
And this one really tells me if you've been paying attention because you have to remember some of the names of those positions that I mentioned. So we have liaisons to the different sections and SIGs. We have the publications team, the media team. We have different professional development team members. And then um, our grant coordinators, mentorship program coordinators, all right, see pharmaceutical science represented. So we do have lots of liaisons to the different pharmaceutical science areas, professional development, working on the career development toolkit, mentorship program, that's great, media and publications. So really a wide range of things that people are interested in. Media team, social media is fun. That's definitely for sure. Well, I don't wanna to go too far past my time, but um, I've just got a few more slides to kind of wrap up. Um, if this has convinced you that you are interested in becoming a YPG member, I will tell you that it's open to any pharmacists, pharmaceutical scientists or students who are under 35 or graduated less than five years ago from their first degree in pharmacy. And if you join FIP and you meet those requirements, you automatically get registered as a YPG member. And the membership fee is dependent on your country. So um, it's between 19 and 50 euros. Um, some of the benefits are essentially um, to have this connection to a global network, to have access to very uh, reliable information from FIP. There are various educational opportunities uh, and uh, we try to really make it possible for uh, pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists to exchange information and connect with one another. If you aren't convinced about joining as a member yet, you can still register for free for all of our events and webinars. So um, if you go to this website, fip.org slash events, you can see all of our upcoming webinars, all of which are free, um, and you can join and connect and learn just um, without even being a member. And then, of course, you can follow FIP and YPG on social media. Uh, whether or not you're a member, you can still learn about some really great opportunities this way. We share anything we think is interesting and impactful for our members. So um, definitely recommend following us. All right, well, thank you for your time. Yeah, and thank you very much. That was, again, really, really insightful. And actually going back to that, um, so you're talking a bit about the um, development goals and BPSA actually has a policy in place at the moment um, in support of those and saying that we're gonna be advocating for those with everything we do. So that was really, really great to see you talk about those um, and definitely something that our members are really passionate about. But thank you so much for that and all the opportunities again. I'm sure everyone's overwhelmed with how many things you can get involved with, but I think that's the main message to take from this is that there's so many international opportunities and it's just about taking them. Um, they don't always come to you. Sometimes you have to go looking for them. So even attending today's webinar is just a really, really great step to do that. So thank you very much, Louisa. And we'll now move on to Victoria. Um, so Victoria was appointed as the first executive director of the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association in 2016. Her dedication has significantly increased the charity's footprint and work streams, uh, supporting better access to and use of medicines in lower resource settings, including pioneering the highly commended Commonwealth Partnerships in Antimicrobial Stewardship Programme. She has led advocacy for the profession in numerous high-level policy forums and is the Civil Society representative on the Commonwealth Advisory Committee on Health. Prior to this, Victoria led both service and workforce development through international collaborations in flagship hospitals in London and Singapore. Uh, developing an extensive global practice portfolio. And I'll now pass over to you um, to introduce yourself and get the slides up. Thanks, Daniel. Um, okay. I'm just going to get my slides up here. Okay. Can everybody hear me? I can. And... Good. 
Uh, I find it um, very strange to um, be presenting without the chat that you get from an audience. It's uh, it's very weird, isn't it? These whole Zoom presentations, and I still haven't got used to it after all this time. But I know you're all there, so just bear with me. Um, so thanks, Daniel. Um, um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background about myself, um, a little bit of information about the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association, and some ways that perhaps you can get involved and um, I do have some interactive bits as we go along so I hope to kind of um, keep your attention because I know that it's getting late and it's nearly my bedtime actually I don't know about you guys but I think I'm a bit older than you aren't, aren't I so um, anyway let's move on so a little bit about me um, if I can get my slides to move on so my pharmacy journey began um, way back I won't tell you what year this was um, and I got a job as a Saturday girl in the Lloyd's pharmacy um, and it wasn't uh, accidental I um, scoped out what I'd like to do um, as a Saturday job and decided that my love for science and people was perfectly matched in pharmacy and, and actually I really enjoyed it and that was the start of my pharmacy career um, the one thing I really enjoyed was dressing the windows and that was something that um, you know I was quite proud of to make these windows look nice and arrange the boxes in the pharmacy so a little bit of OCD pharmacists coming out there I think but um, just a little bit of fun to start with really. Um, so my pharmacy career began here, my leadership career um, began way back school days, I always found myself in these leadership positions you know um, I was the um, the sports leader or the head of the youth group or um, I ended up as head girl and I didn't intentionally mean to be any of these things it just kind of happened um, I had this knack of trying to um, create a vision and, and getting people behind me and believing in that vision and I think the one that sticks in my mind the most is um, I don't know if you recognize this very famous group but it's the Spice Girls um, on screen here um, and I managed to convince some of uh, my friends during sixth form to dress up as the Spice Girls and appear with me on a BBC documentary um, in London. So um, that's really where my leadership career began. And I think those those um, kind of influencing skills has, have, have uh, stood me in good stead ever since. Um, my international career, I've always wanted to work globally it, ever since I was in my teens and I kind of started to kind of be aware of, you know, what's going on around the world. I got involved in a lot of charity work I was as I was growing up. Um, and I like to think my international career really began here, began here. Um, School of Pharmacy, University of London. I don't know if any of you guys are from the School of Pharmacy. It's uh, the UCL School of Pharmacy now, but it was the Square or SOP when I was there. But um, I met people from all around the world for the very first time because I was growing up in Kent in a very small town. And, you know, I hadn't really um, kind of met people that had lived abroad or overseas. And this was my first experience of it. And it really broadened my mind and it just made me interested and curious. And it was the start of uh, everything that's hap happening um, in my career now, really. Um, but kind of before I could have that, amazing international career I had to educate myself so I finished university finished my pre-reg and started work at um, this hospital I, I, if you can see on the screen I don't know if any of you recognize it um, anyone want to guess what hospital this was and for this one will yeah Chelsea and Westminster I've got no not no, close but not quite it's correct region any other guesses St Mary's, no, not quite. No, not Imperial. No, not Hammersmith. Not Guy's. Was a competitor to Guy's at the time when I applied. <laughs> almost Kings. Oh, you're almost there. Come on, it's really famous, guys. <laughs> Near St Paul's Cathedral, does that help? UCLH, no, not quite. You've named every single one of them, but this one. Come on, you can get it, you can get it. St George's, oh, I think I have to tell you, this is Bart, St Bartholomew's Hospital, um, which is part of um, Bart's in the London. So I started off here, um, ended up becoming a cardiac and intensive care specialist, didn't really know where that was gonna take me at the time, just did stuff that I enjoyed and I was passionate about and um, did my certificate and diploma. And just as I was finishing my diploma, 
I said to my husband, I, I fancy moving abroad. What do you think? And um, he he kind of looked at me a bit, bit kind of shocked. Um, but then there was an advert that I saw in um, the New Scientist for scientists. Um, actually, and he was a scientist, so I was getting him a job first. Um, in in a country overseas, obviously. Um, can anyone name this country before I give it away? You probably know because we've already mentioned it. But um, what's this country? Yay, Singapore. That's right. You've all got it. It's very famous, this picture, isn't it? So we saw this um, job advertised in the New Scientist for scientists in this new startup um, kind of pharmaceutical um, branch of um, GSK in um, Singapore. And I said to my husband, why don't you just try? And he investigated it and he ended up knowing some of the people that were there. And it, one thing led to another. And, you know, we saw this advert in probably Christmas time. And by July, we'd moved out there and I'd got a job. Um, but it wasn't all plain sailing. And I just wanted to say this to you, when you want to do something a bit different, it can often be quite challenging. Um, I did a lot of research before I went. I knew, um, you know, some people out there, some of my friends that um, I met at the School of Pharmacy were, were um, residents in Singapore. And I asked them about pharmacy in Singapore. I said, what do you think? Should I go? Um, and they actually said to me, no, don't go. <laughs> they said that... Um, the working hours are crazy. You'll get, um, you'll work six days a week and you won't get any leisure time. Um, it, the pharmacy there is really behind. Um, you, you know, it will be a real challenge for you. You'll end up just counting aspirin. You won't be doing clinical services. So I didn't really hear anything good. Um, but actually I quite like a challenge. So um, what would you do in this situation? Would you go or would you kind of listen to people and think, oh, not sure about that or would you want to find out yourself so would you go or would you would you stay in the UK so do you want to put in the chat box would you go to Singapore yeah see for yourself follow your heart go yeah oh, that's kind of everything that that went through my mind at the time and um as Walt Disney said all our dreams can come true if we've got the courage to pursue them and even now I tell my kids you know you've got to feel the fear but, but do it anyway because these kind of um decisions are never easy and and like leaving your family and, and friends and um colleagues and I really enjoyed my job at the time it, it was a challenge but I went and I ended up being the cardiac and intensive care pharmacist at the um national um heart center in Singapore um I can't say to you that I loved every minute but the, nobody loves every minute of any job I don't think but it was a real learning curve for me and I grew exponentially in terms of um, every soft skill that you can imagine um, and as well as my um, clinical knowledge because I had to pioneer a lot of the services that we developed and um, it was quite right clinical pharmacy was in its kind of infancy when I went but Singapore have done a fantastic job I have to tell you in you know a very short time bringing their clinical pharmacy services up to sort of world class and I'm pictured here with Doreen Tan who's one of the the leaders in pharmacy now in in Singapore but we were a bit younger back then so um anyway so while we were there I was obviously a clinical pharmacist but we also did a lot in terms of workforce development and I, I like to think that you know my skills of um, making my friends dress as Spice Girls all those years ago and that kind of um, influencing um, skill set that I have enabled me to convince my bosses and the chief pharmacist of Singapore at that time that we should develop a clinical um, sort of a general level framework for pharmacists in Singapore and a career pathway and that would help retain our pharmacists and you know give them better job satisfaction improve patient care so I ended up um, getting um, some collaborations together um, between Singapore and the UK and Australia and I don't know if any of you re recognize any of these uh, faces here on my screen um, I think those of you that are part of FIP might recognize um, this gentleman here um, who has been instrumental in a lot of um, sort of international work, um, you know, all around the globe. So um, we managed to develop this general level framework. We um, improved, you know, career, the career path for pharmacists. Um, we sort of um, managed to retain our pharmacists. So now getting a job there is much harder than it used to be because they were so desperate to recruit before. Um, now I think, you know, 
pharmacies develop to a stage where people actually want to work there. Um, I have to say the working hours were quite hard. Um, and when I was there, I used to get, I think it was one, two days off a month at one point, which was tough. Um, but, you know, it was, it, I had great colleagues and, um, you know, it was work-life integration, as they called it, rather than work-life balance, which is something which uh, I, I'm not sure how that fits with well-being, but there we go. So just wanted to give you a bit of background and just say, if you've got a dream and you've got a passion, then, you know, follow, follow your heart and um, see where it gets you. You'll always learn something. So we left Singapore in um, 2016 had no clue what we were going to do. We had no house to live in in the UK. My husband didn't have a job. His company shut down very suddenly. Didn't know what I was going to do. And I ended up um, being, um, well, headhunted, if you like, for this role, which had just become available, um, the first executive director of the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association. So how many of you have heard of the CPA? Because we're a lot smaller than FYP. Um, but I'm just interested to know how many people have heard of CPA. Anybody? Okay, a few people. Good. So um, I don't know if any of you know, but we've been around a long time, since the 70s. Um, we were set up by the Royal Pharmaceutical Society, and you can see the kind of uh, original bunch of people here. Um, the RPS or the Royal Pharmaceutical Society, in case you're kind of not familiar with that, if you're from overseas or something, um, used to host the CPA conferences as well. So, um, you know, when it was part of GPHC each year, um, it would help to, um, you know, create these kind of joint conferences with all different nations of the Commonwealth. So we would visit a different Commonwealth nation every two years. Um, and strengthen their own National Pharmacy Association by lending our support. Um, obviously, things have changed with COVID um, and, you know, international travel is a lot more difficult. But that's where it all started back in the 70s. And really, we were created to help to share resources between higher and lower income countries um, and try to strengthen the pharmacy profession and therefore the use of medicines, um, access to medicines and um, health and well-being of their populations um just a little quiz question the commonwealth how what what um percentage of the world's population do you think it encompasses just to check you're still listening any ideas 36 percent. anyone got higher or lower 15 oh so Jeffrey's on the ball. It's a third of the world's population. So it's a very significant number. And a lot of that population is in um, lower middle income countries. So lower resource settings. So this is just a little bit about us. Um, we kind of have access to about um, a million pharmacists globally. Our mission is to lead and develop the pharmacy profession across the Commonwealth. And our strategic goals here are to de develop the pharmacy workforce and build capacity through education and training, support pharmacists to strengthen health systems and enhance the safe and effective use of medicines, prevention of disease and promotion of healthier lifestyles, and advocate for improved access and quality of medicines and vaccines, embedding pharmacists at all levels of medicines management. And you can see here um, some of our pharmacists in um, Rwanda. Um, and there's a, um, some information underneath there. 60% of the Commonwealth population are young people less than 29 years old. And that's really significant um, and something, you know, that we continually try to engage with the youth networks in the Commonwealth. Um, and there's quite a few. There's the Commonwealth Health Youth Network um, and various different um, sort of organizations like us have kind of um, youth chapters as well. So our approach is to work collaboratively. Um, we work with our member organizations who are the national pharmacy associations of those Commonwealth countries and various different partners. We're often asked about FYP. Um, we are much smaller than FYP, but we have a very close relationship with them. Um, Catherine and I are very good friends from years ago. Um, and it's great to be able to be working with her in this capacity. Um, I think FIP does some amazing work and we just um, signed a new MO, well, about to sign a new MOU with them, um, looking at the different areas of alignment that we're working with, um, working together on. 
so um we do work very closely together um and um i think it's fantastic the stuff that, that they're doing um, we develop resources networks and opportunities for pharmacists um, to help to improve the health of their communities and we are a charity um, everything we do is for the benefit of the public and our charitable objectives are there in case you want to have a look. Um, we're an accredited organisation of the Commonwealth, which is really exciting. So it means that we work with our grassroots organisations, who are our national pharmacy associations, but we also have access to the um, Commonwealth heads of government meetings, the Commonwealth health ministers meetings, and we can advocate for things that our members want at these meetings and in the advocacy channels that, that feed into them as well. Just to give you an idea, we're part of the Commonwealth Health Professions Alliance as well, which represents the doctors and nurses and all the other professions that you can think of. So there's a much bigger body than just just pharmacy here. And um, we're in special relationship with WHO and we're growing that relationship now. Um, and I've, as I said before, we, we work closely with um, other partners such as FYP. Some of our core areas of work are listed here. So um, we're looking at capacity development, health system strengthening, and we've just launched a, an online uh, CPD platform, which has been developed specifically for low bandwidth countries. Um, a lot of our, the uh, lower income countries that we work with struggle with internet access. Um, so we're creating um, courses on there. We've launched our AMS and AMR modules. We're about to launch our TB. Malaria is in the pipeline and, and there's, there's lots more to come. And that's been um, you know, a way of actually not just um, uh, educating pharmacists, but actually helping to build capacity of the national pharmacy associations, because we encourage pharmacists to join their national association and get access to the platform through them rather than, you know, becoming an individual member, which we don't really promote. We would much rather that they join their national pharmacy association um, because we want to build the capacity. We believe that nationally pharmacists have got a much louder voice if, if they're and part of their national association. And we also um, have um, pioneered the Global Health Partnerships, which is the um, Commonwealth Partnerships in Antimicrobial Stewardship, which I'll talk about, about in a second, and the Global Health Fellows Scheme. Um, in terms of practice resources, um, we do something called FarmAid, where we collect recent editions of the British National Formulary and send them out to our members every year. And that's been going on since the 70s. Um, we'll obviously look to digitalize that eventually, um, but it's still very much appreciated based on the research that, that we've, we've done. And you can see some pharmacists receiving books here in one of the pictures. Um, we have developed a prescribing app, um, which initially has information about um, antimicrobial prescribing, but we're building on that um, to try to give people, pharmacists and, um, and other healthcare professionals access to guidelines um, offline in settings where perhaps the internet connections is not so great. Um, we do a lot around advocacy and policy because of our links to government. And um, so we have the civil society policy forum each year. We ran that forum this year and we take it in turns with the other healthcare professionals. And our one was around access to medicines and vaccines in the context of COVID-19. So that was very topical. We got a very good turnout and we have um, a policy brief that came out of that um, and various action points that we um, kind of presented to the health ministers that we're building um, um, work plans around now. So that includes an access forum um, to try and sort of discuss some of these broader access issues to medicines and vaccines in, in our Commonwealth countries. Um, we do a lot around World Antimicrobial Awareness Week and Fight the Fakes Week, which is coming up next week. They're two things which really impact our countries a lot, but we also mark other health days if you'll follow our Twitter feed as well. I'm nearly there. Um, so just to give you an overview, this is just an example of some of the stuff we do. Um, we're creating programs to try and um, strengthen pharmacy capacity. This is one of them. So Commonwealth Partnerships for Antimicrobial Stewardship. Um, this was um, this began in 2018 um, with it's sponsored by the um, UK's Department of Health and Social Care's Fleming Fund. And the aim is to share skills and knowledge between the UK. And initially it was for countries, Ghana, Tanzania, Zambia and Uganda to enhance antimicrobial stewardship and tackle AMR 
Um, and we just extended that to a further four countries, um, which is um, Nigeria, Kenya, Sierra Leone and Malawi. Um, we run this programme with our partner SET, who have got a very um, uh, well tried and tested model that they've used for health partnerships for, for many years. And we provide the technical leadership um, in that programme. So it's the first health partnerships program that um, that have run where there's been a focus on pharmacy, which is really exciting. Um, and we've obviously done a lot of background research to kind of design the program. So there was some scoping studies done before we took on this program just to kind of identify exactly which areas we should be focusing on to make sure that we were effective. So CPAMS takes a partnership partnership approach and it focuses on antimicrobial stewardship, including antibiotic use and surveillance, infection prevention control, and antimicrobial pharmacy expertise and capacity. And this program has been quite um, uh, amazing really in, in what it's achieved during a pandemic. So we've had 12 partnerships, which finished um, in June this year, um, involved 187 volunteers from the UK and 102 volunteers from the four um, African countries, um, 300 and sorry, 3,312 health workers were trained across these four countries um, in aspects of antimicrobial stewardship. Um, we encouraged um, institutions to collect data through the Global Points Prevalence Survey so we could see what antibiotic use was happening. Um, and we, for a non-research um, programme, have already published 14 publications from this work, which is quite amazing, really, um, considering, you know, this was not designed as a research programme in the first place. So alongside this, we ran the Global Health Fellows Programme, which was um, funded by HEE. And this gave a chance for the UK pharmacists involved in this to undergo some leadership training um, and to have mentors and un um, undertake a project in um, quality improvement in AMS, get some publications. And it's been so successful that we, um, we've got funding to run it again this year. Um, and this is the kind of thing that we hope to do more of um, in terms of, you know, finding um, opportunities for pharmacists to get more involved in global health. Um, and we've just done a scoping study um, because this is obviously, you know, been something we've run in the UK because that's where the fundings come from. We've just done a scoping study um, with our African colleagues who are part of the CPAMS programme. And there's a real um, hunger for something similar there and a very good buy-in from their national stakeholders actually. And, you know, we were surprised about how supportive they, they, they seem of something like this in terms of supporting pharmacists to becoming leaders in, in these areas. Um, so just to finish off, how can you help? Well, we're not as big as FYP. We don't have all these committees and, and things like that, which, you know, I think is fantastic. Um, but we do have expressions of interest now and again that come out, you know, to come and work with us, whether it be in a volunteer capacity, whether it be um, a paid um, piece of work. Um, we release a lot of policy briefs and publications. It'd be great if you can um, share some of those to help disseminate our work. Um, as I said, we've got these global health partnerships that we're developing to so keep your eye out. You know, if, if um, you become aware of some that, you know, you might be able to access, it'd be great to have your involvement. Um, we have our social media channels, so please follow us on Twitter and Facebook and, and see what we're doing. Um, comment and share and, and get involved really. Um, we do have opportunities for um, research students, so we've got... Um, two university um, students from uh, Nottingham this year. We had two last year and we've got one from UCL this year. And we had one last year um, doing their final M Farm programme. Um, but there are of, often opportunities to get involved in um, other projects that we're running as well. So keep your eye out for those. Um, and obviously like participate in our events and conferences, webinars and, and help us to raise that profile of pharmacy. Um, that's what we're always, always all here to do um so what opportunities do you want that's my last question to you guys um you know i've talked a bit about some of the things we're doing but is there anything else that you want in terms of your pharmacy career what opportunities could we help create for you that you you would appreciate so have you got any ideas that i can steal from you <laughs> 
I hope someone, I hope you're all still there. <laughs> pharmaceutical opportunities, is that to work, work in pharma? So working in the pharmaceutical industry, okay. Um, placements, okay, what kind of placements would you like? Would you like um, long placements, short placements? Um, what about internships? Would you be interested in doing a year's internship? Um, summer placements, okay, good humanitarian internship I don't know about humanitarian it's quite hard to get involved in those um because I think they're cautious in sending people to kind of humanitarian areas without um you know the training and there's a lot of insurance issues but definitely the theory of it internships okay so would, would how many of you were to consider an internship I mean obviously you want to go and do your pre-reg and, and get that under your belt but in, at some point, would you consider something like an internship to kind of get more experience in global health? Okay, that's really interesting. So we were talking about that just this week, actually. Um, so if you're all keen, we, we could, um, yeah, I think a year might be too long. How could we best fit it around your pre-reg? Would you want to do it before pre-reg or after pre-reg? After, before? after before it's kind of split isn't it okay that's interesting and if you were to do an internship what would you like to get out of it before and after yeah <laughs> so do you want to be involved in delivering projects creating projects just having an experience being part of a global health charity make a global impact in pharmacy, yeah. Experience of... Okay, it's all really good answers. It's good to hear your enthusiasm, networking, advocacy. I, th I really like the idea um, FIP have about, you know, in engaging students in some of their working groups. And I, I, th I think that probably will help you maybe without you even realizing it just to kind of get a feel for how work happens and you know how meetings are run and like how projects come about and hopefully if you've got people leading the groups anyway um creating and teaching teaching okay at what point did, would you feel comfortable creating teaching material for other countries would you feel like you needed to have completed your pre-reg to do that um what's your kind of um confidence level on teaching virtual teaching I, I should say at this point because we can't travel so complete your pre-reg yeah okay what about um kind of mentoring opportunities would you would you like to um be involved in mentoring other pharmacists okay so having some kind of buddy system, perhaps, where you're kind of you have a pharmacist who's trying to develop in a certain area that you're also trying to develop in and, um, you know, perhaps doing some of that learning together. I think that would be good. I wish we could talk. I'm like talking to a screen and people are popping up. I, I really appreciate your um, your chat inputs, um, but it would be good to have a proper chat one day. OK. I'm really impressed. I think there's a lot more um, enthusiasm out there than I ever imagined. So thank you. Um, well, I, I will take this on board and I will go back to the team with renewed enthusiasm for getting uh, students involved. And um, perhaps, Daniel, if we do have any um, kind of opportunities in the future, we might be able to kind of put them out through you guys. Yeah, for sure. Just send them my way. You have my email and We'll try and get them on our social media potentially. Um, but no, it's really, really great to see everyone in the chat. Like, really, really good input there. Yeah, thank you. Right, I'll hand back to you. <laughs> okay, you're all done? Yes, there you go. Okay, well, thank you so much. That was really, really insightful. And looking at all the partnerships that you have with so many countries as well, I think it's just really inspirational from a student perspective because you know that, you know, you can be working in, you know countries in Africa you mentioned Singapore that you've worked in just really really great to see that and 
really, really engaging talk. So thank you for that. And I can see lots of thank yous in the chat as well. So I think everyone's thank you. really enjoyed that. Um, and Louisa and Alice, if you're still there, do you want to pop your cameras on and we can try and go through some questions? So just a quick Q&A panel discussion. Um, so at this point, I know you've popped lots of questions in the chat. You've put some of the Q&A, which we've tried to answer as we go along. If you've got any questions, it could be something general for everyone or something specific to one member, then maybe um, just you know pop them in the Q&A section or you can pop them in the chat and we will answer, answer those. I'll give you about yeah, 30 seconds to type um, if you might have a longer question. And in the meanwhile, I will just pop our BPSA social media in the chat. So if you've got any questions, either Q&A or chat function, if not, um, we can maybe go over some of the ones that have been answered previously. Okay, we've got one from Ogu. So for Alice and Louisa, do you offer any work experience and or summer placements? We start with Alice. Sorry. Um, sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. What do you mean by work experience? Uh, are you so, talking about, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think work experience, it could be paid or unpaid, but just an opportunity to work within, so you mentioned the WHO Academy, but also the World Health Organization in general, just so as maybe a, a pharmacy student in the UK, what opportunities would you have to be working or doing placements within WHO? I think that's the question. Correct me if I'm wrong. And, and when you mean placement, you mean internships or? That kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was saying before. Unfortunately, the, the internship are, are being stopped in WHO because of the pandemic, but it should restart really soon. Um, and apart from that, WHO is only doing a paid internship now. Uh, they have a new policy in place that they really want to make sure uh, the student have the money to come to Geneva or come to other um, office, WHO office. So there's a whole process for uh, getting an internship and you have to go through the, I would say the, um, the, the usual uh, job um, process, even for an internship. So uh, you will need to wait until it can restart. But uh, as I was saying, if you can check on the website of Share With You as most frequent as possible and you will be informed once it's, uh, it's starting again. Yeah, and the website's in the Q&A function, yeah. the answer to the question, just in case um, you weren't sure where to find that. And Louisa? So I think the closest thing with YPG is our remote volunteering program. So um, this isn't really over the summer necessarily, but there are certainly opportunities in the summertime. Um, and it can range from one month to six months, and sometimes it's extended even to a year. Um, and it's often, you know, um, maybe a commitment of between two and 20 hours a week. So it's very flexible um, and mostly, you know, remote, obviously. So. Um, you can do it even when you're a student. So definitely something to be aware of and keep an eye out for. We do post opportunities on social media, but it is only open to YPG members. So another good reason to become a member. And Victoria, I know the question wasn't directed to you, but do you have any sort of internships, summer placement opportunities with the CPA? So not currently, but as I said, it's something that we've been talking about recently. Um, and again, like, you know, we would want to make sure that they were sort of paid internships if we if we could um unless it was just a very very part-time volunteer you know position where people were maybe inputting into a certain project or you know something like that but um you know I think it's yeah it's important isn't it you know WHO have recognized it but just because people are young and want to learn doesn't mean they shouldn't pay them <laughs> um, so yeah if you're contributing to the organization we'll we'll find a way of paying <laughs> fantastic and um, we'll now move on to our next questions so this is from sebastian who was in my role prior to me last year so we'll um start with louisa this time so what do you wish you did more as a student in regards to like international engagement um this is a hard question i did get pretty involved as a student but i think i because i live in the us 
we have very limited student exchange program placements with IPSF. So only, I think it's like 15 people in the entire United States get placed. Um, and I did apply, but I didn't get to do it. And I've definitely regretted that because I've heard of and seen some amazing pictures and stories from set placement. So um, since you have that opportunity available to you right now, I highly encourage you to apply. Yeah, for sure. And again, just to mention, it was written in the chat, can first years apply? You can apply regardless of your year and even during your pre-reg year. But if you're unsuccessful one year, apply the next year, apply the next year. It's just something that I think this is like a skill that you should have for life as well. It's just perseverance is, you know, is key. People won't always get things handed to you. You just got to work towards them and keep trying. But definitely, yeah, getting involved with the student exchange program would be a really good opportunity and lots and lots of other IPSF stuff. So obviously the S stands for students. So if you have any questions about those opportunities, just drop me an email um, and I'll pop that email in the chat later on but Victoria anything you would have maybe done differently during your student years in regards to international engagement? Yeah I think I would have first of all visited all of my friends that I'd made at uni that were from all these different countries <laughs> and got a better feel for things out, out there and um, I think I was quite young and probably a bit daunted by the thought of it but I should have made more of that and um, secondly I think just take every opportunity and I'm quite good at taking most of them but some of them scared me a bit too much and I didn't do it and I applied to go on um, I don't know if any of you have heard of the mercy ships where um they basically this is a massive hospital boat that goes around um usually in Africa um and, and they have a pharmacist on board and I applied to go there and I chickened out the last minute because I was about to get married and I was like six months away I don't know if I can cope with it but I should have done it I should have done it um, and I wish I'd done it and so I think you know just advice of take take every opportunity I mean maybe there's reasons why things don't happen but um and then there, there was three wasn't there how else can you get involved internationally I think network network ask questions um and just you know volunteer because that's how it all starts um you know and once people get to know you and know you know what you can do within an organization then things like carry on from there everything I did in Singapore that got me somewhere was for free volunteering everything I did but going above and beyond that you know clinical pharmacy um cardiac job everything else was in my own time developing the career pathways leading conferences but that's they're the things that are going to set you apart in your career and get you the places that you want to eventually um so that's it for me I'll be quiet now yeah, that's that's really interesting about the boat um having a pharmacist on a on a boat is that yeah. what you said yeah in africa that's something i hadn't heard i of still want to do it i i yeah i've got yeah one day <laughs> on my um, and alice um as a student anything that you would have done differently in regards to your international engagement yeah, um, so me during my studies, I've done, I mean, one exchange and one exchange in Denmark and one hospital internship in Canada. But I think my, I mean, it's an international experience, but it's also a system that is not very different from France. So I would have gone to something which is very much, I would say, in a more um, least developed country or middle income country to really try to understand the different contexts that I, I really knew nothing about. And um, I mean, it's really important to when you're a student and when sometimes you're not really made mature enough or you spend a lot of time, I mean, sometimes thinking about problems that are not problems. And I think this is a good time also to face the reality of very difficult context. And um, I would, and this is something I think I would have loved to do. It's just maybe I was a little bit scared to go by myself in a place that I really don't know what it's gonna look like. And I know nothing about it, but I think um, I think I would have done this. It would really have um, brought me like so many things and I would have learned so many things. So yes, international experience is great, but not all international experience are the same. And I think it's important to try things that really get you out of your comfort zone uh, because this is where you you learn so much from yourself and from others yeah that's really important yeah just different experiences and different places as you said like experiencing say pharmacy in Singapore must be so different uh, in Malawi in the USA France like 
all of these experiences are going to be so different. You're going to gain so many different skills from them. Um, we'll now move on to the next question, which is from Soz, and it's in the Q&A section. And it's, how did you build experience and skills to procure international opportunities? So just talking about your skill development um, and experiences. And we'll start with you, Victoria. Oh, well, I think um, it, it's a case of um, networking a lot and knowing the right people, making a good impression, because then when opportunities come up, you're more likely to get picked, I suppose. Um, building experience is really just about going out of your comfort zone because otherwise you don't build any experience do you you just carry on so pushing yourself out there to do something new as I said volunteer get involved find a mentor find a coach or somebody that can help guide you that's really been um, an important part of my career path especially or, or people that you look up to you know just approach them and say you know can I can I grab a coffee with you I want to talk to you about this and just you know get involved in the right circles so find other people that are doing the sorts of things that you want to do and um yeah just get involved yeah and I think all three organizations that you work for you've got those sort of like mentorship opportunities or you've got the networking as well you're speaking about I mean I know Alice you mentioned about um connecting with you on LinkedIn you know even just small steps like that going on there looking through people in sectors that you're interested in I think that's always going to be a good starting point and then they'll post about their personal journeys within the role which again is really insightful and then you, know, you get a whole feed of different people's experiences finding out what works for you what doesn't um but yeah again even just coming to this webinar is such a good you know step in the right direction and um, Alice anything to add to that like developing the skills maybe overcoming like imposter syndrome as well so feeling like you're not good enough um any tips on that yeah every day <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say you I'm not the right person to ask because <laughs> this is something I, I feel every day um but I guess it's just like I mean it's just talking to people I, I completely agree with what, what Victoria said is really about talking to people and and I mean even even just like it's not just an informal discussion it's not always about can I, if you, I mean, do you have any internship to offer? Do you have any job to offer? It's really important to have truly, um, I would say, sincere discussion on what is your job like? Why do you like this job? I mean, or, um, or a very simple question that sometimes we don't dare to ask, which will really help you to find if this is the type of work, this is the type of life, this is the type of decision or the type of working environment you want to work in. And sometimes there's also, I know that sometimes everybody wants to work in WHO because it's very prestigious. There's, it's very good image, a very good reputation of WHO, but it's also learn, knowing that working in an organization like the UN, like WHO is not easy. It's very, I mean, you have a lot of procedure. It's very hard to get in. It's, um, there's, it's very long to, to get a new project in. It's very, I would say you have a lot of papers to fill in and this is your daily way, your daily work. Is this something you really want or do you want the title? Do you want, you know, the, the position of working at WHO? And I think this is the type of question that the earlier you ask to people that actually work there, the earlier you will find a place where you feel good and you will feel empowered and you really feel like confident and you will really be a good pharmacist, I guess. Um, so I think it's going beyond what you see, what the image of, of a, an organization, of a job, of a title, and really trying to understand the daily job and the daily and the competencies that you need to have this job. Fantastic. Um, and maybe pose this one to you, um, Louisa, and it's from Eloise, and it's what is your advice for finding a good career mentor? Because I'm aware that you offer the mentorship scheme. Um, yeah, fire away. Yeah, so I mean, I definitely recommend um, looking into the YPG mentorship program. It, we offer it uh, once a year for nine months. Um, and it's a great way to get connected with people who are already highly involved in FIP and YPG. But um, I think we need mentors all over the place. So um, even, you know, professors at school, older students, um, early career pharmacists that you know that went to your school before, anyone you have a connection to that is doing something you're interested in doing can be a good mentor. 
Um, it's just about building that connection. Like Alice said, asking them the questions that really will help you decide whether or not something is gonna be a good fit for you. And Victoria, I know you mentioned the point about the good mentor. So is there anything you'd like to add on finding a good career mentor for you? Yeah, I think that um, one thing that I would say is it took me a while to realize the difference between a coach and a mentor. And during your career, probably both of those will be, be important. Um, and I don't know if you all know the difference or not, but I guess a mentor is more about your your career and like, where should I go? Or how should I get from here to there? What skills do I need? But a coach is more about developing you as a person. And I found that that, that is sometimes, um, you know, the first step, because if you, once you get to know yourself and you can identify your strengths and it, sometimes it helps just having somebody outside to do that with and um, then you know your career path becomes a bit clearer and um, sometimes because you know it's that Jahari window thing isn't it I don't know if any of you have heard of that but you know if somebody else um comes in and um gives you feedback sometimes it's sort of you get these light bulb moments of like oh really I'm good at that am I I didn't realize or you know so I think both are really important um and yeah use your networks um you know and find people that you you look up to and um you know you would want to um have a similar career path to or you know have qualities that you admire um and and just have a chat with them and see if they'll be prepared to to meet with you Amazing. And there was a few questions um, about the student exchange program, so I can take those ones. So you've got um, from the lad, is there a limit on the number of applications we can make per year on the different locations available? So that one, if it's about the student exchange program, it's one application per year. Um, and as Patrick mentioned earlier, applications are open now and they close on 31st of December. So you apply just by going and making an account on the IPSF website. If you're a member of the BPSA, you're automatically a member of IPSF. So it's a free membership, which is really, really great. And you apply once a year. If you're unsuccessful, apply the next year, apply the year after that, and just keep going. And as we've heard tonight, there's so many other opportunities and also so many other international opportunities as well with IPSF. So we've got things like attending the World Congress, we can have you know lots of different um well you have your, your voice be heard in different discussions you'll also get to meet pharmacy students from all over the world there's also the regional symposiums those are in the five different regions of IPSF so getting involved with those but all of these things are found in social media as um are all the opportunities mentioned earlier so just staying involved with that is always going to be your best chance to find out about these opportunities and then uh, was specifically set you get three countries um, per year so or three member organizations should I say so you'd rank them first choice second choice and first second and third choice and then go from there and see see how it plays out and then Noor um, mentioned I think it was mentioned earlier that accommodation and personal expenses have to be sorted by the students and it depends on where you go would we get support from SEP for this so that's a really good question. Um, so the BPSA executive, we actually had a meeting just this weekend gone in St Albans and we were discussing the idea of a travel fund. So we're looking into the sort of logistics of that and then we'll try and get that opportunity publicised again on social media. And you can apply for that if you feel that you're, you know, unable to access these events because you're in financial hardship. Um, big you know moral um sort of perspective of the bpsa is that we're supporting every member and um, not just the ones that can afford it so definitely do look out for that so there will be a travel fund and that will help with the student exchange program and the other opportunities that i've mentioned earlier sorry that's a lot i feel like this whole webinar is a lot of information thrown at you but hopefully that um has answered those questions and then how long does it take to hear back from set that is, um, so applications close 31st of December, and then you'd probably expect a response um, by like February time. Um, so you usually make sure that you have at least two months prior to going on SEP where you can actually you know, book flights, 
sort out accommodation, work with the student exchange officer in that country. So um, yeah, hopefully that answers that question. Just gonna check the Q&A section. Um, okay, we'll make this the final question and maybe just like um, round it up with, um, I guess, should we say, I'll flip the question slightly just to, what's everyone's like highs and lows? Um, and if you're talking about your lows, how did you overcome them maybe? I think that'd be quite a good place to end this. So if we'll start with Alice, um, just with your international career in general. Uh, me, honestly, I'm, um, I am. I feel like uh, working in an international environment is something that I could never, how can I say it? I don't want to lose this because for me, it's bringing so much at the personal and the professional level. It's also about always putting things into perspective and always trying to, to think beyond your actual, um, I would say, way of seeing things. And I feel like this is really good for me and this is really good for the work we're doing. So this is something I will, I really don't want to lose. Um, I would say that the down thing is sometimes we lose, I mean, in the international, in WHO, for example, which is very much diverse uh, and we are working with really different countries. Um, sometimes we lose time in, in communication. We need to take some time, a little bit more time to explain what we are actually talking about and to make sure everybody's aligned. And this is, and sometimes it feels like we are talking for a long time on the same on the same project, on the same issue. So this is something, sometimes you have, you have to be patient. You have to make sure everybody understand what you want to say. You have to repeat things and you have to try different channels to make sure everybody understand. So it's just maybe it will go a little bit slower than if you were working only with your, your national fellows from your country, but you know the impact will be bigger and the idea will be bigger because it will actually take into account diversity and that's what makes a project work and that will bring everybody together. So, so it's, uh, it's something that honestly, I've, uh, now I've, I've tasted it and I, I want to keep this and I really, and I really can't lose this. So I, yeah, um, it's everybody, it's everything that I like. So thank you. Perfect. No, really, really good answer there. Uh, Louisa? I really agree with everything Alice said. Um, I think specifically for me, one of the high points is just getting to see all the different perspectives that, you know, our different backgrounds bring to the table. So um, kind of figuring out how to best communicate and really bring everyone everyone's ideas together. Um, I guess, especially during the pandemic, one of the challenges is um, all of the meetings can be at very odd times. So I'm always joining meetings at like 1 a.m. or 3 a.m. or 5 a.m. my time when I work from noon to 10 p.m. So it's, uh, it's losing some sleep, but I think it's worth it over overall. Yeah, no, I can definitely relate with the the awkward hours. Obviously, when you do anything <laughs> international, that is always a possibility, but usually worth it um, for sure. And Victoria, highs and lows, and how you've overcome the lows. Um, so related to my current job, I guess um, the highs are seeing other pharmacists achieve like amazing things that you just blow your mind. Um, you know, some of the partnerships that we've had in Africa, we've like, you know, we've managed to create positions for pharmacists on um, kind of boards and, um, you know, these kind of government level. In, and it's not been us, it's been us supporting them doing it themselves. And that's just been like amazing to see. And now they're coming back as consultants for us as part of the Ministry of Health. And like, we've been part of their journey that that's kind of really rewarding. Um, I think that the lows of are probably waiting for grants to turn around. So, um, you know, waiting for, you know, we were promised a grant, I won't say who from, um, back in January last year, we've been waiting and I've been promising people payments and we've only just got it approved. And, you know, you're kind of at the mercy of funders a lot of the time. And that's really hard sometimes. And it's quite lonely because you kind of bear that burden by yourself sometimes when you're kind of at the top, because you don't want to kind of, worry your staff too much do you <laughs> but um yeah there you go yeah all right perfect well thank you so much that was really really good webinar 